Hi, this is Gina Casella from Port St. John, Florida, and you're listening to the Really Big Barbecue Central Show. Happy to have you aboard here for the Really Big Barbecue Show. Boing. We cook because we have to, and we grill because we want to. Hit me. Fine, how you going? <laughs> You have a great show. I'm a big fan. Boing. So what? What? What seems to be the problem here? This man looks like he's dead, and he's in the in the crackle. Charbono. It's all about the Charbono, dude. Succulent fish. What? He ate two feet for wiener. Oh, listen, Lebertius, shut your face. I'm shaking like a dog shit peach seed. <laughs> we have top men working on it right now. And just like that, we are into the second hour. It's the Barbecue Central Show. We talk about barbecue and grilling-related items once a week live on Tuesday nights from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern. That's what's happening right now. In lieu of the live broadcast, you can also subscribe to me through all of the different podcast platforms where you will be alerted on Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays to brand new podcast episodes, which you can listen to at your convenience. If you want to skip a whole month and then binge them on the way to some type of summer vacation, that's certainly your prerogative. Have at it. Be a live listener at least once in your life. You never know what's going to happen. Things could change up very quickly, and now all of a sudden we're in some kind of dire situation. There's nothing more pulse generating than hearing the show go right into the shit can without any notice. By the way, we are broadcasting from Palm City, USA, Cleveland. Still to come in the show this evening, 2022 Barbecue Hall of Famer Leanne Whippin. We'll talk about what getting into the Barbecue Hall of Fame means to her, and then we'll go ahead and do a origin story of sorts as well. Don't forget, you can follow me socially at BBQ Central Show on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Snapchat, slash BBQ Central Show on Facebook and Twitch for live video feeds, slash RD Rempe for a live video feed over on YouTube, and we are audibly live on Clubhouse as well with the usual cast of characters in there taking in the show, just audio only, so we certainly appreciate that. Coming up on the best moments of the Barbecue Central show in 10 minutes or less this coming Friday, episode 241, taking you back to August 16th, 2016. Who do we have this week? The longest running embedded correspondent from Texas and the pitmaster of rogue cookers, Doug Scheiding, is featured back in 2016. We were talking a lot about the competition sanctioning body in Texas, at least at the time the IBCA, or International Barbecue Cookers Association. So if you aren't familiar with Texas competitions, and especially the IBCA, then this will be one that you want to check out, and you will be able to listen to what was hot six years ago with the IBCA. And believe me, it was hot, searing hot news, reviews, and opinions. So see what it's all about. Don't forget, if you want to hear a guest or a segment again on a show that's been lost in the archives, email John. Let him know what you would like to hear in that best of version, J-O-N, at thebbqcentralshow.com. Once again, that's J-O-N, at thebbqcentralshow.com. Upcoming shows in August, at least for the remainder as it sits in the calendar right now. Mike Lang will be on next week. We'll be there to hype up the impending September Grill Fest over at Hartville Hardware, which, as you have come to know, if you're longtime fans of this show, I've been an MC the last handful of years there for that whole day event. But it's the largest independently owned hardware store in the country. It might be the world, but definitely the country. And as I always say, there's full-size homes inside the actual hardware store, just to give you an idea of how big this place is. It's a destination. There's swap meets in the back. There's a restaurant to the right of it. There's a hotel to the right of the restaurant. It's a situation. You got to come and check it out at least once in your life. Just like listening live to the show, you have to come down to the Grill Fest. Watch me do live hosting, interact with Mike Lang. I'll be interacting with DivaQ. It's going to be fun. 
and frivolous potentially, but definitely fun with a lot of great information and demos. You can have food. There'll be special deals, all that fun stuff. And that's going to be mid-September. But Mike and Lang and I will be talking about that next week. Also, Susie Bullock and Todd Bullock will be on here in just a few short weeks. And Chris Young, first-time guest to the show, will be, I'm sorry, second-time guest to the show will be on from Combustion Inc. And, of course, the Embedded Correspondence will be along at the end of the bunch. Much more Derek Riches also. Well, I have some exciting news. There is a brand new animation to be released here this evening. And we're going to do it. First and foremost, I want to give thanks and praise to Damian Rodriguez from Doodles and Things for making this concept come to life. You might recall a few months ago, I had the Meathead Pineapple Bit animated to rave reviews. Everybody loving it, thought it was great. Everybody thought Damien nailed a meathead and nailed me, and the way that he animated us brought a whole new realm of fascination with this bit. Listening to it audio only is one that makes the mind race, but then seeing it animated is adding a whole other level to it. And Damien came up with the whole concept there. I just sent him the audio and said, have at it, kid. And I say, kid, with all due respect, because he is a kid that's doing this. So he ran with the concept, used the audio for inspiration, and developed that whole cartoon of pineapple that we all love. This time around, I sent him the audio, and I sent him concept ideas Specifically on this one, because if you don't follow Jeremy Andrus on social media, you might have missed a photo that he posted of himself. I don't know if it was a month ago or so. Uh, look, Jeremy is in great shape. I don't know how old he is. He appears to have young kids, but that doesn't mean he's up in age. But he certainly hasn't let himself go by any stretch of the imagination, aside from having magnanimous wealth. He does have a very lean physique, trimmed and chiseled. And he was shirtless on his Instagram with a brisket, uh, holding a brisket in both hands. And I saw that and I said, wow, here we go. We're going to have an animation. I'm going to go back through the interview I did with him. I'm going to pull out a bit of that interview. And in however it gets animated from there, it's going to be me having a conversation with shirtless, muscular Jeremy Andrus, but we're going to ramp it up a notch. We're going to make him look like he is over buff, perhaps dealing a little bit or uh, partaking in a little bit of the juice. He doesn't, but we wanted to ramp it up a little bit because it's fun when you do this stuff in animation. So I gave him the concept there and he put this cartoon together. It's absolutely spectacular. I'm going to show it to you here in a second. And as soon as you get done watching this one, you're going to be like, oh, I can't wait for the next one. Well, good news. There's another one already in the works. Rough Draft has always has already been approved. Down Payment is in. He's now working on final animation. Let me just say this. I will tease it with this. That's all I'm saying about it. That's it. You can't put two and two together. I don't know what to say, but it's going to be awesome. I saw the Rough Draft. I also gave him concept on that, but he's picking up my concepts and bringing it across the goal line. Without any further ado, and for your listening and watching pleasure, by the way, if you're texting me on a podcast, you got to go back and watch this on the video if you don't follow me on social media. If you do, you've already seen it, but you're going to want to see it again. The Jeremy Andrus, Greg Reppy, new animation for your approval. Jeremy, two questions before I let you go, and I really appreciate the time this evening. Traeger seems like the place to have a dedicated podcast through my research on you. Mm. You're an investor in Zencaster. There's no Traeger podcast. How did you know that? Come on. I mean, I'm a professional here. I'm not some jamoke, you know, running some stupid show. I mean, I do, I do my homework here. So you're an investor in Zencaster, but no podcast yeah. for Traeger. Why no podcast? You know what? Uh, you've inspired me to push harder on this idea. I, I, we, we, we've talked about this. There are no shortage of ideas, but this one, I agree. This one's obvious. You think about the great conversations that you can have. 
I love the idea. Look, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think it could be, bring our community together. Last question. It's a big one. At the end of 2022, will Jeremy Andrews still be the CEO of Traeger Grills? I will be here <laughs> at the end of this year. Yes. Wow. How great is that? It's hard to only watch that, and I apologize. We're going to be running out of time, and I can't play it three, four, five times in a row. I could, but I'm not going to do it. So if you don't follow me socially, get on any one of the channels. Follow me. It's all there. You can watch it as many times as you want. But when you watch it the first time, it's hard to just get past my face and Jeremy's face in utter disbelief at how talented Damien is in nailing us in our characters. The way he has Jeremy portrayed, his face is dead-ass nailed. And then you have the muscularity, the working out, the lifting of the Traeger grills, the one side push-up with a side of beef on him. But as you look further into the background on those chalkboards, on my pieces of paper, he had the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame city in the background. I mean, he is nailing minutia. This level of professionalism for a kid this age is unheard of. He's going to be a talent. He's going to be leaving me behind, but not yet. We still have one to come. Keep an eye out, if you know what I mean. Keep an eye out. All right, Leanne Whippen will be joining us here in just one moment. I will talk to you about Primo Grills, by the way. Programming note, if you didn't see it on Twitter. This coming Saturday, we will be doing a live remote with Nick Bauer, president of Primo Grills at their big dealer event out there in Illinois. So join us around 3 p.m. Eastern this coming Saturday. You can learn all about the dealer event and what you can expect as a potential consumer or a current customer with things that are going to be happening during the course of the rest of 2022. So what do we love about ceramic cookers? We love that they're fuel efficient. We love that you can achieve low and slow temperatures for traditional barbecue meat and that you can get rip roaring hot for high temperature grilling of steaks and other thin cuts. But what's missing in the everyday ceramic lineup? The real ability to do true two-zone cooking. Two-zone cooking, very important to both professional and backyard cooks alike. It's the best way to manage a fire and cook with confidence. However... Getting a two-zone fire and a round ceramic cooker, not very realistic. Why? Because it's round. Enter Primo Grills and their game-changing oval design. The shape gives you the ability to execute a two-zone setup that you desire. It also gives you the other ceramic grill benefits as well. Really, when you break it down, there's more than 60 different ways to configure the Primo cooker, so you're only limited by your culinary imagination. Here's the bottom line. Best ceramics in the biz? Yes. Patented technology? Of course. True two-zone cooking capabilities? I just said that. Multiple sizes? Oh, yes. And if you just have to have a round ceramic cooker because you can't get your head around what an oval is and why it's better and why people will love you for having an oval cooker, it's fine. They have a round. But if I may plead with you, the oval one. That's where it's at. Only sold through dealers. Primogrill.com. That's Primogrill.com. Check them out. Leanne Whippen is in the green room, and we'll be back with her in just one second. Stick around. We'll be right back. You're listening to the number one most downloaded barbecue and grilling podcast anywhere. The Barbecue Central Show. Howard Stern, Jim Rome, Dan Patrick, and Greg Rampey. The Mountain Rushmore of talk show entertainment. Now, let's get back to the Barbecue Central Show. This portion of the show being brought to you by Smithfield. Head on over to smithfield.com right now for tips and tricks from well-known live fire cooks like Darren Wart, Jess Priles, and Chiles Cridlin, mouth-watering flavor. No artificial ingredients. Smithfield Fresh Pork is quite simply some of the finest pork money can buy. It's the trusted choice of top cooks for use at competitions and at home. Again, that's smithfield.com. Years and years of support here to the show, which we certainly appreciate. Laura Paul and the gang 
out there. My next guest, or my guest in the second hour, certainly no stranger to this show over the years. She has provided some of the most memorable moments on the show, the most impactful, perhaps, as I had mentioned in the first hour, being a part of that very first competition brisket roundtable back in 2006 or so, if you can believe it. She's opened and run barbecue restaurants, been on TV a number of times, a spokesperson for Pit Boss Cookers, and a few months back inducted into the barbecue Hall of Fame. So let's go ahead and race to the hotline and welcome back friend of the show, Leanne Whippen. Hey, Leanne. Hey, good evening. It's nice to be here. Great uh, to see you. Very happy to have you and appreciate you making time for the show as always. As I just mentioned in the intro, now 16 years of on and off barbecue talks here with Barbecue Central Show. Do you know any other show that has lasted this long talking about such nonsense and tomfoolery? I do not, and you're doing a great job all the time. <laughs> Let's start with the Barbecue Hall of Fame. You have been many times the bridesmaid, but this year we finally cross over that threshold and go in. When you get the call from Emily Park letting you know that you are going to be part of that class of 2022, what are the first reactions and emotions that hit you as you're now realizing you're going into the Barbecue Hall of Fame? Well, first off, I, I, you know, it was my third year being nominated and I kind of know after a couple of years how it goes, usually get the call a couple of days before, you know, keep it under wraps, you know, that you're nominated. And, uh, the show of course was being aired live on your show and it was about 10 minutes before it aired, oh. I got the call. So it was, I, I didn't expect it. It caught me really off guard and therefore I was even more surprised. Uh, and it was very exciting for me to get the call. <laughs> um, so I, I uh, it's, it's very surreal. Uh, it really doesn't sink in for a while and, and now it's starting to sink in and it's, it's an amazing feeling, uh, to get, recognition you know for all the years that i've put into it and you know it's something that i love to do and it's just awesome to be recognized by everyone leanne whippen joining us here on the show you can go to her website leannewhippenbbq.com which when she was on last time in november she was just talking about securing that website but now it is up and mm -hmm. running of course you can follow her socially at leanne whippen across most of the platforms did you feel like getting into the barbecue hall of fame should have happened sooner than this should it have taken three times for you to cross over um there's a lot of people out there that have many accolades and are deserving of nominations and you know being inducted and it it's just a tough field to be in and you just don't know if you're if the timing is right and I just feel as, you know, I, I got out of the restaurant business a year or so ago and I thought to myself, wow, it, you know, I always thought about the Barbecue Hall of Fame and in a lot of things that I do, I'm like, is that going to hurt me? Because I stepped away from that for a while, but I jumped into other opportunities still staying along the lines of barbecue. So I feel like I've crossed almost every area of barbecue that you can, except for writing a book, you know, from being a competitor, a restaurateur, you know, and now a brand ambassador. And uh, so I, I felt as if I, I, I crossed every section that needed to be covered. And also for, you know, the 25 years that I've been doing it, I've dedicated my life to barbecue, really uh, wholeheartedly. And I've made a lot of sacrifices along the way. So it's just, it, again, it's very nice to be recognized. If you wouldn't have gotten in, would it weigh on you? Would you think about that? Absolutely. Really? <laughs> 100%. I think, you know, even when I got nominated, you know, and then I didn't get in, I was like, okay, what can I do differently? I mean, it, I seriously thought about these things. And is there anything I can do that can help me along? And um, because it has been a, a goal for me. And it would have weighed really heavily on me if it, if I, I would have felt like if I don't get in, I felt like at the point that I didn't even know that I got in. I, I figured it's it's not going to happen and I'm just going to have to move on with my life and I probably won't even get nominated again. I figured three times that's it. If you aren't in, you aren't in. That's what I thought. What are your thoughts on the Barbecue Hall of Fame? High level, what can be improved 
to make it more generally known that it's an actual thing because you know i talk to people each and every week especially when the hall of fame time of year comes around we do that here's the final show and then three weeks later we reveal who's actually making up that class there's people in this industry leanne that don't even know that there's a barbecue hall of fame they don't know who's in it don't even know it's a thing i think that's the biggest issue lack of general visibility especially within the live fire community what are your thoughts I agree. I, I There's a lot of people, you know, I've been to events recently where people say, you know, congratulations. And they're like, for what? What did she do <laughs> recently? And they say Barbecue Hall of Fame. And they're like, what's that? You know, so there are a lot of people that don't know about it. And I, I think a lot of the issues are, you know, nominations have to be sent in and it can't be by yourself. Um, so if someone could be worthy of being in the Hall of Fame, but if they don't get, if someone doesn't nominate them, then nothing happens with it. So I, I do agree with you on that point. It needs to be, um, I don't know, more out there. And I, I really don't know what the answer is to do that because they really, you know, they give out the awards at the American Royal. It's one of the biggest contests. There's a lot of people there and a lot of people talk in the community, but still, I just don't think it gets out there enough. Leanne, you go in with Ed Mitchell, Joe Traeger, and John Marcus, all very deserving, all highly accomplished. Do you have any thoughts on any of them, or or do some of them stand to you personally over and above that you would like to comment on? Um, I, I think they all deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. It's, it's almost come full circus, circle as it relates to John Marcus, because we work together, of course, on Barbecue Pitmasters. And we, we've stayed in touch over the years and it's, it's just kind of not ironic, but when we both got nominated, I, I, we texted each other. And I'm like, here we go again. I said, wouldn't that be something if this is our year? And sure enough, it happened. And, you know, afterward we were just like, God, it's a strange feeling, isn't it? And, and he said, yeah, when I got the call, I really, I felt different. And it, it, it is amazing how it sinks in and it does make you feel different. Leanne Whippen joining us here on the show, talking about what it's like to be a barbecue Hall of Famer. But enough about that nonsense. Let's go ahead and uh -huh. get to know Leanne Whippen in an origin story type of way, like we did with John Marcus a couple months ago. And let's take it all the way back. Where were you born? Miami, Florida. So my dad, my mom was staying with my grandmother at the time because my dad was flying, you know, airplanes off of aircraft carriers and he was on an aircraft carrier when I was being born. So he wasn't around for that moment. So that's why I was born in Miami. I, I was raised in Jersey because he uh, was a captain with TWA Airlines and he was based at a Kennedy airport. So that's where I spent most of my life, um, all the way elementary, middle, high school, was in Sparta, New, New Jersey. So when people say, where are you from? I say, New Jersey. They're like, how do you know how to barbecue? Well, my dad, his roots are, he's a Kansas City, he was a Kansas City boy. He was born, born and raised on my Nana's hog farm in Lexington, Missouri. So we would always go see her. I have pictures of me little with, you know, hogs around my feet. And we go to Arthur Bryant's and Gates and, um, you know, we were just always into the barbecue thing and, and, you know, my dad would be cooking it in the backyard. And then in 19, actually it was prior to 1996, he, he was, um, he got to know Carolyn and Gary Wells very well to the point where, you know, they'd spend time at our house. Carolyn Wells actually bought me my first set of knives, if oh. you can believe that. Wow. And she had gone and got carbon knives from all of these stores in Kansas city and put together a knife kit for me. And, uh, that was pretty cool. So he, he got involved with that. And of course, you know, he told me about it and, and we went to judging class together in at the Shelby contest and we got certified as judges and he started writing, you know, his tidbits, tabs, tidbits in, in the publication, the bull sheet and going to contests. And he was just learning the whole thing about contests. He started, you know, the try on North Carolina state championship. But as it relates to me, I just fell in love with barbecue and, um, you know, there were, I was in Atlanta working um, for the Hyatt Regency Atlanta and my background, believe it or not, before barbecue was in food and beverage. So I was- Leanne, let me stop you, you know, there because we're jumping yeah. way ahead. 
We we have uh-huh. so many years to get to before we even get to any of this professional oh, okay. stuff. Here. Uh, <laughs> prior to starting any kind of schooling that you can remember, what kind of kid were you? Uh, I was a little bit of a tomboy, loved to fish, still love to fish. You know, I'd go and catch salamanders and put him in my mom's milk box and she'd bury the fish, you know, in, in, in holes to, you know, use for fertilizer for her plants. I would go out and, and paint white X's on the back of turtles, you know, uh, they were out in the lake where we lived. So I was, I was very much a tomboy. I was into sports. Um, you know, I liked water ski, snow ski, ice skate, all of that. Cause I was, you know, available year round, you know, I mean, we had the seasons up in Jersey. So a little bit of a tomboy. How many people in the family? Just me and my sister. All right. Do you recall you and your sister getting along swimmingly? What kind of a relationship do you have as you kind of grow up uh, getting into that high school range? We were kind of opposites growing up. Um, I was kind of like the good student. She she wasn't so much, but um, she, she and I got along very well, but we are so close now that we probably talk almost on a daily basis. Um, our family has always been tight over the years, but growing up, we did we did have some issues. <laughs> From a home life perspective growing up, what kind of relationship do you have with your mom and, and what kind of relationship do you have with your dad? Well, my dad was always gone half the month flying. So... Um, I wasn't as close with him growing up as I was with my mom because, you know, back in the day, you know, the moms usually, you know, stayed home. So um, very close with mom growing up and and we grew up in a pilot community. So the neighbors were really close. We always were having barbecues together, spending time, you know, outside a lot, whereas you don't see that so much today. So we were always outside. I remember whether, you know, be croquet, badminton, whatever. So I really had a, a very, a, a very great upbringing and had a lot of fun. <laughs> when you're around a community that's probably in similar situations, do you notice in a missing way that your dad's gone, you know, uh, half the year and he's home half the year? Does he, does he miss things that you're like, man, you know, I wish he would have been here for that. I'm sure, you know, he probably thinks that. But as a kid being a part of that, what does that do to you? It's funny. It, since I was raised that way, I didn't know know any differently. So I didn't know the way it was to have a father around all the time. So I, I just didn't know any different. So it, 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 it didn't bother me. It was just, uh, you know, my way of life at the time. Did your mom feel like she had to be both mom and potentially disciplinarian dad? No, my dad uh, was more of the, <laughs> he disciplined us more than my mom. I mean, uh, you know, my my sister, I remember she used to uh, eat ice cream sundaes with tons of sprinkles and la- a lot of maraschino cherries. And if she didn't, uh, we, we always had to eat everything on our plate before we got dessert. And, you know, if we didn't, we got sent to our room and that would be my dad that would be doing that. <laughs> so, uh, no, I, was, I, I do remember one time fishing with my dad and my grandmother and thinking, why don't we do this more often? And there would, th- that did cross my mind at that time. But other than that, it was, it was pretty much how I grew up. So as I said, I didn't know any different. So as you're growing up here, is there a culinary groundwork that's also being laid at this point in your life? Absolutely. So uh, as I said, we we always had uh, family and friends and neighbors, and my dad was always grilling. He had a Weber kettle in the backyard. I'll never forget it. And the big thing was he would cook ribs and he wouldn't even send an invite out. Everyone knew the smell and they'd all come over and, you know, it was like, it was just a thing. Um, You know, we would do steam clams on the deck. You know, we were always doing corn on the cob. Uh, My mom grew fresh tomatoes. Uh, So we always grew up um, eating a lot and barbecuing a lot. Leanne Whippen joining us here on the show. Leanne Whippen, BBQ.com, her website. So as you get into high school, things change. People try to start becoming a little bit more independent, finding their own identity. How was high school like for you? High school was great. Uh, I really 
I had a great group of friends. Um, you know, we spent a lot of this, you know, summers out on the lake. Uh, I really didn't have any problems in high school. You know, we really didn't have all these terrible things you hear about in school about bullying. I don't ever remember anything like that. I just remember it being a great experience. From uh, after high school, is it one of those things where you're just immediately thinking about going to college? I think nowadays there's still it's weird so i have kids that are you know oh, two that are in college now one's getting ready to actually finish college in a year or so i have another one that's starting her second year when i was graduating from high school it almost felt like so this would be 92 it felt like that was a demand that parents were putting on their kids you have to go to college in order to be successful in life later on maybe that's because in their generation there wasn't a lot of kids going to college Mm -hmm. or as many and somehow that's translated into success now i always have a running dialogue with myself on should they be going to college look how much it costs uh what's the advantage are they going to be how much in debt are they going to be just to say they went to college because they're all not going to be chemists and doctors and all specialty degrees when you were going out of high school did you feel a pressure to go to college I did. Um, I, I felt as if um, my dad put a lot of pressure on me. He wanted me, you know, he wanted me to go to the best college that I could get into. Uh, he went to colleges with me to take tours. But at the time, I, I decided what I wanted to do. Um, and this was in my senior year of college. I decided that I wanted to follow my father's footsteps and be a pilot. So I actually paid for, with my own money, flying lessons when I was in high school, and I flew Cessna 152s and, and, and Piper Cubs off of grass fields, and you know I, I put myself through ground school. And so that was my goal. I wanted to be a pilot, and my dad backed me 100%. The problem was I wanted to get into Purdue's flight school, and they had, at the time, they only took 30 people in that class and 10 of them from, were from out of state and 20 for, were in state and I couldn't get in with my grades. So my angle was to go to Indiana University, establish residency, and then try to, in my <laughs> sophomore year, try to <laughs> transfer over. But I loved IU, so I stayed there. Um, and so that the, the, the pilot thing went out the w- window and it was very expensive at the time. And then my dad's mm-hmm. like, well, you should join the National Guard. And he had all these suggestions, none of which I, I, I was ready to do. So um, that did fall by the wayside. And then, you know, during the summer is when I started working in hotels. And that's when I started getting it. I fell in love with the whole food and beverage angle of hotels. So do you end up uh, graduating college with some type of business degree or uh, finance or something? I actually didn't graduate IU. I I had um, a a small tragedy happen with a friend of mine and I ended up leaving. Um, And I I what what does that mean? A small tragedy? Uh, a friend of mine got, um, let's just say, injured, and um, it, it wasn't a very good thing. And so I went home and decided I would take a year off. And then I got into the hotels, and then just I started moving up so rapidly in the hotels that I thought, I don't even need to go back to college. And then I wrote back to IU and I said, All right, I'm ready to come back. And they accepted me back. And I said, no, (laughs) I'm just going to keep working in hotels. So that's what I did. I just kept working my way up the ladder in hotels. It almost sounds uh, akin to the Brooke Orson story where Brad had her come to work for him over the course of the summer. And then all of a sudden, Brooke never goes back to college uh, because she's having too much fun with Brad, uh, having too much fun uh, making money and and doing the restaurant thing with Brad. That's uh, definitely interesting. So you don't technically graduate. Now you're in um, professional setting. As you said, you're shooting up the, the corporate ranks there. Is this now in all forms of hotel business or are you, are you in culinary? Uh, so I started off in the sales department, you know, selling sleeping rooms and, you know, convention blocks and that sort of thing. And then... Um, one of the girls that was in the catering department quit. And I said, you know what, let me try to move over to that position because I, I like food. And 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 I ended up excelling in that. And then I found a job opportunity 
at a Holiday Inn in Livingston, New Jersey, where they were looking for a catering director. And I'll never forget the interview because when I walked in there, uh, the gentleman who was in charge of food and beverage for like five of their properties said, okay, if you're going to be, you know, serving a wedding, what are you going to suggest for an appetizer? And I was just dumbfounded. I was like, an appetizer for a wedding? I, I don't know. And he says, well, don't you think that a salad or a, a fruit cup would be appropriate? And I said, absolutely, 100%. And so anyway, the, the, I ended up getting the job and I stayed there for quite a few years and I was catering director and I, I did weddings there, uh, bat mitzvahs and, you know, I was actually, you know, running these things and, you know, putting the chair there for the bride to sit in and, you know, the whole thing. And then, um, th then I ended up meeting my my first husband and he uh was a publisher for new jersey success magazine anyway long story short he got a job right after we got married in guam so i moved to guam and oh. i became uh and he was a publisher for the guam tribune and i was the island gourmet writer so i wrote the food column and all the recipes while i was <laughs> pregnant and having my first child so i kind of stayed in the whole food thing so i was actually a food columnist for for that newspaper for a couple of years wow uh so we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we'll come back. We'll follow up on a lot of that stuff because uh, that's good, juicy, personal stuff that, of course, we want to talk about. So stand by, Leanne. We'll be right back in just one second. And as we get ready to talk a little bit more, I will mention my good pal Sterling Ball and the gang over at Big Papa Smokers, the one-stop online shop for all things barbecue. Their curated selection of only the best outdoor cooking and grilling supplies getting you on the path to better barbecue results in no time. Everything on the website has been Pitmaster approved by Sterling Big Papa Ball himself. Known for the championship rubs and seasonings, popular flavors like Sweet Money, Cattle Prod, Cash Cow, all proven winners on the competition circuit and in the backyard. Big Papa Smokers offering 13 perfectly balanced flavors to transform ordinary meals into extraordinary also the owner of Granny's Barbecue Sauce. So if you're looking for a new go-to sauce or you're sick of what's currently out there and you want to try something a little bit new, Granny's Barbecue Sauce is what you want to go for. Aside from the premium selection of rubs and sauces, Big Papa's offering the very best charcoal pell pellet and wood cookers available today. If you're looking for a versatile smoker that's easy to use, check out that Mac 2-Star General Pellet Cooker. Big Papa Smokers, the exclusive Mac dealer, even offering special packages. If you're not a fan of pellet smokers, fine. If you're not sure of what grill you need, don't worry. Call them. Ask questions. 877-828-0727. That's 877-828-0727. Or shop their website at BigPapaSmokers.com. That's B-I-G-P-O-P-P-A Smokers. Dot com. We are back with more Leanne Whippin conversation right after this. Stick around. You're listening to the number one most downloaded barbecue and grilling podcast anywhere. The Barbecue Central Show. Let's get back to a guy who has more experience giving you his opinion than he actually has cooking. Once again, here's your host. Greg Rampey. Welcome back. Back in the day, watches were made to be worn in the pocket. And after World War II, wristwatches came into vogue. The pocket watches quickly became an afterthought, finding their way into sock drawers and scrap heaps. And that's a tragedy. But Entic Vortic Watch Company, helping bridge the gap between America's storied watch manufacturing past and bringing it to the present day, where wristwatches are finding incredible popularity once again. And here's the coolest part. Each watch that they make is unique and one of a kind. Nobody has one just like yours. Vortic founded on the motto that America wasn't assembled. It was built. Check them out at VorticWatches.com. And we are rejoined by Leanne Whippin, LeanneWhippinBBQ.com on social media at Leanne Whippin. All right. So you had dropped a whole bunch of stuff right there as we went out to the break. You've moved to Guam. You're married. You're got a kid on the way. You're the island gourmet, which may or may not sound like some kind of nepotism to me, but we'll leave that out of it because you know who the publisher is or the editor. Um, so uh, you meet your husband. Like, what's what's the love story there? How does that all come to happen? 
So when I worked at the Holiday in Livingston, we used to have these things um, at nighttime, and I still think that hotels do this, but they were manager cocktail parties. And the people that stayed in the hotel would, you know, come and get a free drink and some appetizers. And we as managers in the hotel would bartend and we would, you know, talk to the customers and um, socialize. And that's where I met him. He happened to be staying at the hotel because he was the publisher for New Jersey Success Magazine. So that's where I met him. And that's where we got to know each other. Do you guys day pretty quick and then get married pretty quick or was it a kind yeah, of a we, long we thing? Yeah, we dated for all of, <laughs> I think we dated three months and got engaged. And then we were married about six months later. And then the day after I got married is when we moved to Guam. <laughs> you saw that on the radar? Like that wasn't something where he was like, hey, we got to move to Guam real quick? It was a little bit of a surprise and I don't like hot weather that much. So it was even more <laughs> shocking because I had never been there before. And anyway, I I went to Guam. <laughs> I mean, would we say and it was as, a we, shocker. as we look back at it, would we say <sighs> the minute he says we're going to Guam, it's thin ice at that point, like we're not headed in the right direction? I was too far deep in and... Um, <laughs> My family was extremely upset because they didn't see it coming. And it was one of those things like he got this job offer he couldn't refuse. And, you know, we got to do it. So I did it. And I remember getting off the plane and it was hot as could be. And I looked around and it was there was <laughs> nothing there. And we drove and he's like, oh, the island's so beautiful. We drove around. There's the Micronesia Mall. Big deal with a the Sears there. And it. It, it was, there was nothing there except in the bay, Tumon Bay, and that's where all of the beautiful resort hotels were, but that was it. I mean, and everything was super expensive, and it was hot. I was miserable, mm. just miserable, but then, I stayed there for the, I stayed there for a couple of years. And then you're quickly pregnant, or did that happen like yes. a year or so in? Yes, Um so I was married in February, and then the following April um, is when I had Brittany. So Brittany was born on Guam, which was like having a child in a forest. Let <laughs> me just put it that way. The hospitals weren't too <laughs> great at the time. So what's it like being a new mother in Guam and then also writing uh, some, some type of column? Well, um, I, I was getting bored, um, but... I did some interesting things. I mean, we traveled and went to Palau and Saipan. So I did see that part of the world. The Miss Universe pageant was held there and I was a judge for it. Um, really? So I did some. Yeah, I who, was a judge who, for who the won? Miss Universe. Uh, you know what? I can't even remember. Uh, it was so long ago. But I have I have um, a VCR tape of it. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it, it, it was, it was interesting. Um, the thing about Guam is the power goes out quite often there. People don't know this, but there are no birds on the island of Guam. And the reason is because all the brown tree snakes have eaten them all. So there are no birds there. And the brown tree snakes climb up, you know, the transformers because they like the buzz of the transformers. And so when they go up there, they make the power go out. So wow. that that was another thing that was really odd about the island that not, I mean, I don't hear anybody talk about it and it's true. <laughs> no birds. <laughs> wow. That's, I, 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 that's another thing that I didn't know anything about. So you've, you, you make it, you said uh, two years. Is that also, so you're coming back to the States at that point. Is that also the end of the marriage? Uh, no, we came back married and he got another publishing job and we moved to Pontiac, Illinois, which we lived on a farm with a cornfield, you know, so we're going from the island to the cornfields. And again, you know, I'm having trouble with this whole thing. Um, and I, I just, I was getting bored. I, you know, I, I was used to working a lot in hotels and I wasn't writing anymore and there was really nothing for me to do in Illinois. So that's when things fell apart and I moved to Atlanta and I moved in with my sister and that's when I got my mm -hmm. job at the Hyatt Regency Atlanta. And that was a big hotel and that was a big position for me. Do you think if you would have dated six more months or 12 more months, you would have never got married? Uh, it's a possibility. It's a possibility. Um, 
I think if I had known, I don't know. Are I don't you know. young? Like, how old say. are you when you get married? Uh, I was 26. Okay. So oh. I almost felt like I was at the right age to get married. I wasn't looking to get married. But um, yeah, it's just one of the, it, it was a risk, I think. And um, I will say when my dad was walking me down the aisle, if he had said to me, you can turn back if you want to, I might have done that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. You're just looking for the push out the door. Leanne, the door's open to the right if you want to go. Boom. You you would have been out. Oh, wow. brother. So now um, you're in Atlanta. Yeah, so. You're, you're in Atlanta. So, You've moved so, in with your sister. You have. Yep, I've what? been with her, and and that's when my dad got involved with the Kansas City Barbecue Society mm. in 1996. Yeah. Um, and and I said, you know, let's go compete. So they had a contest, a KCBS event in Stone Mountain, Georgia, and I called him up and I said, let's compete. And he's like, he had an Oklahoma Joe, and so we had the equipment, and you know, I had been doing some cooking on my own on my my bullets and sending dad. I still have. Uh, Polaroids of me showing him the uh, first smoke ring I achieved. And I, you know, I had a garage sale. I was selling ribs for a dollar and painted it on a wood board. I have pictures of that. So I was doing it, you know, just for fun. So he's like, okay, well, you know, we'll go ahead and compete. Um, you know, we know what the judges are looking for and let's just do it for the heck of it. And I said, oh, and they're having a whole hog competition. And he said, oh, no, 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 we aren't doing a whole hog. And I said, all right, I get it. It's our first contest. And I hang up the phone and the phone rings like a few minutes later. He goes, where do you want me to get the hog? And so we ended up cooking a whole hog. Wow. And we did this contraption with the chicken wire and broomstick handles so we could flip it. And we had to angle it into the Oklahoma Joe. And we ended up winning fifth in whole hog. I'll wow. never forget it. And, and we won grand champion, which entitled us to go to the Royal. We go to the Royal and and we won first place in pork. And I was like hooked at that point on. This I was like, easy. I've got to do this. That's it. This is what I'm doing. <laughs> wow. Um, when when you look back, uh, you know, leaving that uh, marriage, going into Atlanta, what was like one thing that you learned or uh, in within that process? What do you carry with you this day still? Um. Well, it was a very difficult time for me because, you know, I had my daughter and I was working full time and um, I just, you know, I leaned on my family a lot and they were there for me. And so I, you know, I've just learned how important family is and how they can save you and, uh, you know, keep you going. Now that you are into the competition barbecue scene, you've experienced success at mm -hmm. some of the highest levels right off the bat. Mm -hmm. When do restaurants start to get into your blood? You look at the resume, and there's at least four that I can think of off, uh, off the top of my head that you've uh, yeah, either started I, I or knew, run. Yeah, the thing is, you know, you I knew that I couldn't make a living in barbecue. I had to keep my hotel job. So that's when I bought um, – I figured I was going to buy, you know, a trailer and then try to sell barbecue out of the trailer – so I ended up buying my trailer from Habitual Smokers back in, wow. God, 2002, I guess it was. And I still have that trailer to this day. Wow. It's been modified many times over. But I ended up buying the trailer and I bought a Silverado, which I still have today. And I, I went out to the Midwest, I think, to get the trailer. But before I bought it, I went to the health department. I said, hey, you know, I want to sell barbecue out of this. What do I need to do? Is this the right thing to buy? And, and the health department lady was super sweet. She's like, you got to put in the three compartment sink and da, da, da. And she told me everything I need to do, you know, before I actually bought it. And I bought it with credit cards. I had very good credit <laughs> at the time. So I actually wow. maxed out like three different credit cards. Wow. And did you know, like those cash advance checks? And that's how I bought the trailer. Wow, <laughs> and then, uh, so I, I quit my hotel job in 2002 and hit the road with my trailer competing and uh, selling barbecue and thinking that I would grow business by, you know, doing catering. And it just wasn't enough income. And that's when I decided 
I lived in Chesapeake, Virginia at the time. I saw a card shop that I thought, oh, this is a perfect space for a barbecue joint. And I eyed it for about a year. And then I had heard that the lady was closing it and I ran in there before she left and I said, please rent it to me. And she goes, you got to go through my realtor, but sure. So I ended up doing a full build out in there and, and did my first restaurant. Do you still have that Oklahoma Joe's that your dad had? We just got rid of that and my dad actually gave it away. I wanted to, to bring it with me to Florida, but I would say that was gone about four years ago. Was it yeah, like one of the up, originals? Yeah, it was. Did mm -hmm. Joe Davidson it's, contact was, you to try and get it back? No, but I probably could, I could probably find it. I mean, I know it's sitting somewhere in Tryon, North Carolina, in someone's backyard, probably not being used. The first time I had nowhere to put it, it was heartbreaking when he said, I'm just going to give it to him. He goes, if you want it, you can take it, but you take it right now. And, and I had taken it from him and I did take it to Chesapeake, Virginia. Uh, the throwdown with Bobby Flay was done with that cooker. That's what I cooked on. Wow. Um, and then when I left Virginia and I went to Chicago, obviously I couldn't take it to Chicago. I, I took my trailer. There's only so much I could take. So I brought it back down to him and we used it for, you know, we cooked a couple of hogs on it when I visit. And then finally he's like, it's, I just got to get rid of it. If you can't take it, I'm giving it away. And so I said, okay, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. The first interview that I had with Joe Davidson, oh, it's probably been a year year and a half ago towards the end of that we were talking about his whole start in business was bringing a handful to the oklahoma state fair and then he leaves with you know i think it was a dozen he sold them all and then he left with a order for like 200 cookers and mm -hmm. that's how his smoker business got started but uh, towards the end he said he had been on a, a small mission of going and buying back a lot of those original pieces, not after the sale and, you know, whatever the version mm -hmm. of Oklahoma Joe is now, but the ones that have the uh, serial numbers on the door or wherever they're at, um, he was actively going back. He might have had 25 or, or 30 original Oklahoma Joe's uh, cookers. That, wow. You know, so I'm sure he's always interested in trying to, to get another one back underneath. The, yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you're at Wood Chicks. And you do mm -hmm. that from 2002 to 2013. So that's a pretty well, good Well, I ended up opening up a second Wood Chicks yes. um, in a mall, okay, where they can't have smokers. And I was in the good graces of the health department. They're like, if you can ferry the food over here and keep it hot, we will allow you to do the barbecue. So I did another build out there in their food court. And that was in 2004. So it was only two, wait, no, that was 2006. And then, um, you know, of course, the mall started going away because they built the TJ Maxx and Marshalls across the way. So I was only there for two years. And then I eyed another property, which is a freestanding place with, um, and it was a ribs and company. I don't know if you remember that chain. Nope. And it was Bodie Noel who owns Hardee's that own the property. And the ribs and company went out of business and why I thought that I could go in there and make it work after a corporate place fell apart. I don't know. And of course, you know, when I decide to sign the lease, it's in 2008 and you know what oh, happened yeah. in 2008. Yeah. yeah so, uh, it was the worst timing, you know, possible, but I did secure the lease for five years. And, and so I finished out my first lease for five years and finally, you know, was at the freestanding wood chicks. And then, you know, then the Chicago th thing came around in 2010. So I did finish out my lease at Wood Chicks for the five years. So there was an overlap of Chesapeake, you know, Virginia, that restaurant and uh, Chicago Q. Chicago Q was interesting because aside from maybe one or two other fine dining barbecue establishments, it's really not a concept that you heard too much about. But this one was getting a lot of fanfare. You were attached to it. You had been on TV a number of times at this point, seen success at Woodchicks. What went right and what went wrong with Chicago Q? You can go back and you know look through some of the internet stories, and uh, towards the end, it looked like you had some issues with. Well, uh, the one truth of the, of the matter was, is that you know the gentleman who owned the property flew me out there, and I had lived in Manhattan many years ago, and I I really enjoyed the city life, and so when I went to Chicago. 
I fell in love with it immediately. Yeah. And it was very enticing because he, the property had partially been built out and I knew what it was going to be. It was going to be drop dead gorgeous. It was at a perfect location in the Gold Coast of Chicago. And he made me a deal that I couldn't refuse. And, you know, that pretty much was, you know, move here and, you know, bring your daughter and run this place, you know, and, um, you know, I'll give you half everything. I said, really? And so I actually showed the documents to my attorneys before I took the plunge and they said, looks good to me. What? So I went out there and everything did go well, very, very well. You know, I, they, they were doing no business or we were doing no business on the weekends. I started a brunch. We were doing four and 500 covers. The place was jammed all the time and with celebrities and I did competition ribs, which I, I think I really am the first one that ever did that in the country. And I did competition house ribs and I was selling competition ribs. And you know, this was in 2010 for $35 and we were selling wow. out of them. Wow. And you know, it, it, it was a concept that, you know, had a lot of attention and, you know, we got a lot of media because of the barbecue brunches that we were doing. We were doing, you know, high end Benedicts, you know, with brisket, pork, you know, on different bases, be it, you know, cornbread or biscuits, you know, cheddar biscuits with, you know, three flavored holiday sauces. So and, you know, we were doing, you know, brined, you know, compart to rock pork chops. And so really some cool stuff that I couldn't do in Virginia with the price point in Chicago, I was able to really um, step it up in barbecue. And it was a great great experience when i'm reading through why it goes south it seems like they hold back some money they're not paying you expenses uh they don't give you a steak in the restaurant as they said yeah, they were that, going that's to. basically yeah that's what happened so after five years um it was we were finally starting, you know, it was a huge expense on the build out. So we were actually, you know, starting to make money to go into the pockets. And that's when, um, yeah, my partner decided that, um, you know, that that wasn't going to continue. And I said, well, if it's not, then I'm going to leave. <laughs> and, um, so, and then when in reviewing contracts, it, it technically, it was a five-year contract, but it had automatic renewals. And mm -hmm. um, because of the situation, I said, no. And it was, it was a terrible, terrible thing. And then the Chicago Cut uh, Steakhouse Boys um, ended up uh, coming to me the next day. They had heard about it immediately and they said, well, we'll do a restaurant with you. And I jumped on board with them and they mm -hmm. did a full build out right off of Michigan Avenue. And that was Southern Cut Barbecue. Uh, and, so, and then ultimately you make it back down to Tampa for Devil Pig. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in um, 2018, well, they, they were, they were going to look for properties so that I could be a part owner. Cause at the time I was just their executive chef and there, I didn't foresee it in the near future. So I looked at that and I looked at the fact that, you know, my daughter was starting a family and, you know, my mom's getting older. She lives in Naples and my daughter lived in Tampa. I said, you know, it's now or never, let me go. And so I left on great terms. I still stay in touch with the, those folks. And um, so then I moved down here in, in January of 18 and then um, opened up uh, the deviled pig in October of 18, which was a smaller restaurant. And I didn't want to go back to that fancy dining thing. It's just too much pressure, you know, when you have a hundred employees and I want kind of wanted to go back to my roots of wood chicks. And that's why I opted to do the smaller restaurant. Can you be in the restaurant setting and ever think that this is a place that will stay open for 25 years or 30 years or is going through four or five restaurants in a lifetime more than norm? Um, it's, it's, it's a lot. Um, it'll, it's exhausting. You have to make a lot of sacrifices. I, it, it just felt as a, like I, it wouldn't stop. I was just constantly go, go, go. And that's why I wanted to back off and, you know, go into the smaller restaurant, but the pressure is still there. Um, and you, you start to question after so many years and you look at, you know, how much money you're really taking in. Is it really worth it? Am I making the right decision? You know, and life is passing you by and, and, you know, then 
you know, COVID comes along and I just decide I got to I got to stop this, you know, at least take a break from the restaurant business. It's just not worth it. And um, I don't have any regrets for anything that happened in the past. But honestly, I just so what I'm doing is rather than a restaurant, um, my trailer, I'm putting back in action again. <laughs> uh, so this fall, um, I'm going to be doing a uh, barbecue uh, truck again. <laughs> going back to the roots. Yeah. Oh yeah. So that's as far as I'm going to go though. And I'm going to have someone else, you know, I'm going to do the menu and oversee it, but I'm not going to be working in a hundred degree weather out of the trailer. But I do think that there's a place for it. And who knows, I might make more money with that than what I did in the restaurant business. I just, I don't know. It's like, as soon as I say I'm not going to do it, and then I do it, you know, things change and things happen. But a full on restaurant with employees, I don't see that happening again. So I, I do like the idea of a food truck that that seems manageable. Leanne Whippen joining us here on the show, 2022 Barbecue Hall of Famer. And you can find her at leannewhippenbbq.com website-wise. How does barbecue TV appear to you for the first time? How does it appear? Yeah, like opportunity-wise. Oh, well, uh, you know, this was, you know, the barbecue pit masters was the first time anything like that came around. And I, I didn't even know what to expect from it. And it was so much fun because... You know, we were traveling all over the country and going to contests, and it wasn't like it was scripted. It was the real deal. But you were doing and barbecue was, TV even before that. You were all-star barbecue showdown and things well, like that. Well, yeah, that's right. I did the Kingsford Barbecue Championship Series out in Reno, and and that was another one. And I, I did the throwdown with Bobby Flay. Um, but those were like kind of one-offs. You don't really think about that much. I mean, the, the throwdown did a lot for my business, but um, the, the Pit Master show was way bigger than that. Mm. And it was an unfortunate, I feel, as if the timing was off. It felt like every time they were airing a show, there was some like big sporting event um, <laughs> at the same time. And it was all about the ratings, you know, and if we were going to do a season two. And they fl I don't know if you know this, but they flew all of us, um, you know, all seven of us up to New York. And they they took photographs of us and for season two that's what we thought there was going to be another season two you know myron was there and tuffy and harry and all of us and then all of a sudden there was a little spat or something that happened between tlc and discovery and one of the executives said i don't like the format and they wanted to change the format to what i call a game show format yep. where they have the three teams competing and and then the second series of the original pitmasters never happened but we thought it was going to happen i mean and then all of a sudden no they changed it and so that was kind of strange but um i thought that was the coolest thing and it's a shame that they didn't stick with it because i thought and not just because i was on it it was just that i really thought that that was more exciting to watch than you know the competition type format you know with just a few teams yeah i mean i've said time and time again over the course of the show as it relates to barbecue television that particular season was really in my opinion the one that resonates with folks because mm -hmm. uh, look I, I mean i understand it. if you're just a general person you don't know anything about competition barbecue you see these teams i guess the natural assumption would be leanne's gonna win or myron's gonna win or tuffy's gonna win well guess mm -hmm. what in competition barbecue the five that they're featuring might not do jack shit uh, and they might not do jack shit all year which That's is correct. just a part of it, right? There were mm -hmm. uh, the bigger reason that um, Deadliest Catch or Kardashians or some of these other reality shows are popular is because, yeah, I mean, Deadliest Catch does fishing every single fucking time. I get mm -hmm. it. But the That's audience right. is building a relationship with Sig of the for whatever the Norway ship or this other guy and this other ship. They like their personalities. They're building their re own relationships. They're buying in. They see value there. And fishing just uh, is a part of it. And I thought they could have explored that more. Yeah, certainly barbecue would be a part of it. But if they won or not, really wouldn't be, shouldn't be that big of I agree a with motivating you. factor. It should be, I am buying in on Leanne or I'm buying in on Tuffy and going to the game show to me. And I'm somebody that hates 
all forms of cooking game mm-hmm. shows, Chopped, uh, the, whatever Barbecue Pitmasters yeah. was. So uh, I thought it was a shame. And now it's even a double shame knowing that they had you guys in potentially for a season two. Yeah, yeah, it, it really was. And, um, it, the, you know, the I, I do like um, Michael Simon's, you know, Barbecue USA because, you know, they're kind of doing a similar format where they're following, the you know, a few people around. But yeah, we it, with having, you know, I don't know how many shows we did, six or seven, we were starting to build characters and followers and, and they do re-air that show still. And I have people all the time that remember specifics about shows and they'll say, did your power really go out in Alabama? Is Myron really such a jerk? And it's like, you know, people want to know what the other people were like on the show because they had that interest. It wasn't like, oh, well, I'm sorry you didn't win, you know, in, you know, Dover, Delaware. It was more of like, did that really happen? You know, they were more interested in in the story of it all. Leanne Whippet joining us here on the show. Uh, you know, there seems to be a lot of the same people on TV shows back then, even, I guess, currently, depending on what you think. Mm-hmm. Why do you think that is? And why do you think you are consistently asked to go on TV? Well, I'm, you know, one of the few women barbecue people out there. Um, Also, the fact that I was competing with my kids, you know, my dad occasionally. So that there was the family element there. I was successful in barbecue, you know, um, been doing it a long time and I don't know. Sometimes I can be a little tough and, you know, TV likes that when, you know, you're a little tough or you have a strong personality. So I personalities are, you know, you got to have a personality to be on TV. You can't be super boring because otherwise nobody's going to watch you. So uh, obviously the producers and, and the people that, you know, are looking at you when they do the interviews, they're, they're trying to see all of that. Cause that's what sells, you know, they're trying to make money. So they want to have big personalities. And you've had success on TV and it's certainly been fun to watch recently. Last year you get on with pit boss as a spokesperson or ambassador, whatever mm-hmm. the term is these days, they've had some really tough times along with some of the bigger pellet cooker companies because of how they plan during the best two years of the live fire business uh, layoffs all over. Are you worried about where you might stand going forward as the market starts to correct itself? Um, Well, I think it will correct itself. I think this is just a dip in, you know, it's the economy. It's just everything. And it will come around again. I'm confident of that. I do feel as if Pit Boss is a strong enough brand and has enough family value and smarts about them that they'll get out of it. Um, so no, I'm really not worried, but I just hate to see all these grilling companies going through a tough time right now because it's not just Pit Boss, it's it's everybody. And I, you know, I've I've done interviews with people and and it's the same thing, but hopefully uh, we'll get out of it. And you just have to keep going. You can't give up or woe is me. You know, you just keep going. Are you co-hosting a radio show with Jeff Tracy? I am. I'm co-host on Barbecue Nation. So I do that uh, once a week, which has really been a lot of fun because I get to speak with people, you know, like yourself who um, you might not run across, you know, in in, in where, whatever you do, but you get a chance to speak with them and, um, talking with them is, is really a, a lot of fun. And I, you know, if I wasn't doing that, I wouldn't meet half the people that I do. So I really enjoy it. Aren't you the talent on there? I like Jeff, but <laughs> you bring you on as a co-host <laughs> and a barbecue show. And I think he's got to be second fiddle. <laughs> no, not at all. He's, he, he is the host of the show and I'm the co-host and I take his lead every time and we work together getting guests. So, um, we do, um, talk with each other on who we think should be on the show and, you know, he values my opinion and I value his, and it, it's just been, it's been really nice. It's not super time consuming, you know, it's only an hour and a half a week. Um, so it's been kind of fun. How do you connect in? You have some type of digital ISDN or something like that? 
No, we just like I have the microphone and we have headphones and um, then we just zoom in. We zoom, zoom everybody okay. in. Nice. Yeah. We tried a couple other things and it didn't work that well, but the zoom actually is working all right. Leanne, last qu uh, question before I let you go tonight. Doing a little due diligence on Leanne Whippen, and I did not actually, everybody's going to say I'm full of shit here, but I was not looking for this, but somehow in some search, this showed up second in return. According to networthpost.org, Leanne Whippen has mm -hmm. a net worth of $6 million. True? Um, so if you look at that tomorrow, it will probably change to 1.5 million. And then if you look at it the next day, it'll <laughs> jump to three and 3.7. So I've had people tell me that, and then I'll go and look and I'll say, no, it, it only says I have 1.5 million. And then, then I'll look the next day. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm up to, you know, 8.9 million. This is amazing. And I don't know where they get those numbers from, but, um, I am not worth whatever you said it was. <laughs> I have I have worse news than that, Leanne. Okay. Mutual <laughs> friend of ours, Dr. Barbecue, according to the same website, net worth twenty eight million dollars. He's a mogul. I had no idea. And I and I will tell you that that again is not true. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I can't believe it. Uh, look, Leanne Whippen has spent way more time than she probably should have here this evening. But uh, look, oh, it's been great. Uh, I mean, we've known each other for 16 years uh, doing it like yes. this. At some point, we'll probably meet meet each other in person and it'll be great. But, yes. you know, following your career has been great having you on the show and talking about the the happenings or, or what's hot or getting a retrospective like this is an absolute joy for me. And I'm so happy that you're in the barbecue hall of fame. Certainly well-deserved. Thank you, Greg. I really, really appreciate it. And I wish you continued success on your show. And I know we will be talking again. <laughs> no doubt. Uh, please give my best to Jeff Tracy, your co-host. I will. All I right. will. I appreciate it. There she is. Leanne whipping right there. Pulling almost a full hour as we get the Leanne Whippin origin story. And wow, I mean, that's a lot of stuff that I Guam writing for the uh, the island recipes, the kid going to a farm. She was going to be a pilot. Unbelievable. Great stuff. I mean, this is why we do the origin story so we can really dig in and learn a little bit more than what you. You think you know, but I guarantee not a lot of people knew that Leanne Whippen's original passion wasn't to be one of the best barbecuers out there. It was to fly planes. Her dad was flying planes. Spectacular stuff, and we certainly appreciate her taking all this time to do it. All right, uh, one more piece of business to do before we call it an evening here. And it's my good pal, David Leans, David McDowell. Over at davidleans.com slash bbq. I've been talking to you about it. Now we're on week six. Here we go. Guess who's not fat anymore? Fat. Not me. Following the eating regimen. Knowing what I'm going to eat each and every day. Morning, I can do this. Lunchtime slash snack time, I can do this. Dinner time, I can do this. The recipe's there. The menu's there. We can talk about other options. When I started it, I think I was tipping in at 185, 186. Where are we at as we start week six of the program? 171 pounds, that's right. Here's the good news. It's not just bullshit weight loss. It's a lifestyle change. It's eating changes. It's making good decisions. And then it's sticking to it. It's real easy to just decide to blow it off for a day or a week. But I know I have to fill out that sheet every day. I know I have to be honest because if I'm not honest, it's a waste of my money that I'm paying him and I am paying him. And we're there to talk about it every Monday. What are you doing right? What are you doing wrong? This past week, I followed the eating regimen to a T. Very few cheats, and when they were cheats, it was just because I wasn't in a position to eat exactly what I wanted. I had to do something off the cuff. But instead of just blowing it out of the water, I'm looking over the menu and saying, 
I can take some of this chicken or I can take this dish and only eat half of the rice or half the chicken or turkey, whatever it is. The best thing, I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything. Now, yes, I'm missing in uh, my cardio, of course, but he's helped me with some weightlifting routines. Come on, you gotta be taking advantage of this. I know some of you guys are fat. Fat! Stop it. You don't have to be fat. Don't listen to those people that say, never trust a, a skinny cook. You wouldn't eat Leanne stuff. You wouldn't eat Tuffy stuff. Byron Mixon's leaner than he's ever been. Give me a break. Take advantage of it right now. DavidLeans.com slash BBQ. David Leans, L-E-A-N-S. DavidLeans.com slash BBQ. Sign up right now. Tell him I told you. Actually... He'll know it's me because only the people that know have access to that website, davidleans.com slash bbq. We are back to wrap the show right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back. Old packers, full racks, legs and thighs, injecting butts. If you've never heard this before, you might think you've found the best triple X show ever. Let's get back to the most homoerotic host out there today, Craig Wimpy. All right, welcome back. We thank Leanne Whippen for giving us an extended set of interview minutes. Carrying over here in the second hour, half past. So we will go ahead and call it a day right here. Looking through some of the instant chat here specifically. I'll throw a couple up here. Uh, here is Rick's Barbecue Specialties. Chit, I haven't been 186 since the sixth grade. Fat. Come on, Rick. I'm not even 186 anymore. I'm 171 pounds. Also, Rick coming in with the Standard run, exercise, workout, die anyway. Well, you're right. I'd rather be fluffy and marinated. No doubt about it. Chicken fried barbecue weighing in, who is a uh, new TV star on Barbecue USA. Did you win that contest, chicken fried? I think you won that. I watched it. I'm in shape. Round is a shape. Absolutely. All I'm saying is, if you want to change, you now have access to a support system that can help facilitate, uh, facilitate change. Wanting to do it and then hoping you're going to do it. That never works out. Never works out. All right, let's get out of here all the way back in the first hour. It was Meathead dispelling myths about water pants. Then we talked about drip pants and why you would want to use those. And then we ended about... Using mayo as a binder on brisket chicken fried. If you're ever in a TV contest again or whatever the hell that is. If anybody is going to watch you do brisket, use mayo as a binder on brisket. And then make sure you give credit to me for starting the trend. Because Smoking Joe's Barbecue Pit is doing it. And so is Deuce Raymond. And so is Dick Paste. We're all doing my invention. You should try it next contest. If you win brisket, I'll pay your entry. How about that? After Meathead, we talked with the San Antonio Express News food writer and barbecue writer, Chuck Blount. Again, he's tripling down on the potential success of smoked burgers. I don't know about that. I'm Now I'm leery, but he's tripling down. And then second hour was all Leanne Whippin all the time. Yes, Rick Barbecue Specialties, Dick Pace. He's a TikTok sensation. Look him up. I'm not kidding. He's claiming he's the one that started Mayo as a binder on br brisket, but Dickie Pace is wrong. Wrong. So we thank Leanne Whippin for breaking it all down in the origin story that she did for us. Very fun, very exciting. If you're just tuning in now, don't worry. You will get the full replay on Thursday when it's released. Big show planned for you next week. Susie Bullock and Todd Bullock are in. Also, also, stand by, stand by. I will tell you who's in next week. Why can't I remember? 
Oh, I think I said Mike Lang. Uh, Mike Lang is in next week. Stephen Reich. How do I forget Stephen Reich? But shame on me. Barbecue Hall of Famer. And Susie and Todd Bullock in the second hour. We're lining up a fourth interview segment as well, so stay tuned for that. So, how do I always leave you? September 11th, 2001. I will never forget. Until next Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern, this is your program host and proud U.S. American, Greg Reppy. Good night now! Sam the Cooking Guy, and you're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Some call him a fool, some even call him a douchebag, but I say Greg Rempe is the greatest thing to happen to the barbecue since caveman.